Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. A warm welcome to all of you who are joining us online for today's lecture. For those of you who might not know who I am, my name is Ian Harper, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of Melbourne Business School. And it's my special privilege this afternoon to host our webinar. In the spirit of reconciliation with Indigenous Australians, Melbourne Business School acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which the school's buildings stand, uh, and also from where I imagine most of us will be viewing today's webinar. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I personally acknowledge and welcome uh, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who've joined us for today's lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Crosby, the 2020 Sir Donald Hibbard Lecturer. Mark is in fact no stranger to us, having held a number of academic and administrative roles here at Melbourne Business School until he joined Monash University as the Director of the Bachelor of International Business Program at Monash Business School in October 2016. Mark graduated with a PhD from Queen's University in Canada in 1993 and has held academic appointments at the University of Toronto, the University of New South Wales, and of course here at the University of Melbourne. In 2011, Mark moved to Singapore to take up the role of Dean at the SP Jane School of Global Management before returning to Melbourne Business School in 2013. Mark's academic interests focus on international macroeconomics and particularly on policy issues in the Australian and Asian regions. His published research covers topics such as the role of exchange rates in affecting macroeconomic fluctuations, the impact of macroeconomic factors on election outcomes, and the properties of business cycles. Mark has acted as a consultant to the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and to the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and he held a research fellowship at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority from 2000 until 2005. Mark also consults widely to business and government, both in Australia and overseas, with clients including BHP Bulletin, the World Bank, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, and Tanaga Nazinal Berhad. His most recent consultancies have examined policies for diversifying Brunei's economy, policy issues related to South Africa's increasing current account deficit, and issues relating to exchange rate regimes in Asia. Mark is a regular contributor to the Australian Financial Review and The Age, and he's sought after as a speaker on matters relating to the Australian and international macroeconomic situations. Well, we're privileged today to hear Mark's views on how the global economy will recover post-COVID. Mark's presentation will run for the next 30 minutes or so before I return to pose some of your questions to him. Uh, I'd invite everyone to submit questions as you wish, at any time using the Q&A button on your screens. Uh, in the spirit of democracy, if you see a question submitted that you too would like to see answered, you can upvote it by pressing the thumbs up button. Uh, I should also point out, ladies and gentlemen, that we are in fact recording today's session and it will be published on the MBS website in the coming days. So without further ado, thank you very much again for joining us and let us now pass over to Professor Mark Crosby. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Ian, for that uh, introduction. And thank you also to uh, Christine and Adrian, uh, Dr. Penfold and Professor Hibbert um, for, their, for this endowment. And uh, um, I, I think that these sorts of events and activities are very important in today's world. And I guess very much my presentation will focus on what Australia and other countries can do going forward to support their economies. And education and human capital, I think, is the key. Uh, and for Australia, having been the lucky country, I fear we may have run out of a bit of luck and we may need more than luck to get us through uh, the next few years. And, and our education and human capital is going to be a key part of that. So let me uh, run to the presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, Okay, so hopefully you're all seeing my screen. Um, and uh, in terms of an agenda, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are now. 
and then where we're going uh, and the policy responses. So those will be the sort of economic situation. And then go into geopolitics, which I think is at the moment even more critical than usual in terms of understanding where the global economy is going. A couple of other issues. Um, there's been quite a few questions come in with the registrations already. So I've tried to address a few of those in the presentation. Uh, and I've got a couple of other issues that uh, I'll speak to at the end uh, that I know people are very interested in. Uh, and then we'll take uh, questions from you. So please uh, feel free to send those questions in. In terms of where the economy is now uh, and, and where we're going in the, in the short run, I think the word unprecedented has been used very frequently in the last uh, few months or so. And it, this event that we're seeing COVID uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak and the issues with economies is, is truly unprecedented. And I think uh, in the sense also it, with the economies that we're looking at, um, it's very difficult to forecast. Econ economies and economics is a, a discipline where it's always difficult to forecast. But right now, I would say the next sort of six months or so is pretty much impossible to figure out where economies is, are going. Um, what I've done is presented the OECD's forecasts uh, for the next uh, six to 12 months or so to the end of next year. Um, and you can see there's a wide range of uh, variation in terms of their forecasts. Um, and I think that reflects some of the uncertainty, but already what we've seen with the IMF and the OECD is updates of forecasts very frequently. There's, there's just too much uncertainty to really know where we are while we're dealing with coronavirus. Uh, and even as we get through that, hopefully next year, I think there'll be a lot of uncertainty about the state of the economy uh, through next year, uh, and then we'll see what happens after that. So tell you where we are, um, global GDP has fallen by about 10% in the first half of this year. You'll see wildly varying numbers. And this is such a large fall in GDP, it actually matters what people are reporting. And so you'll see some numbers that say that GDP has fallen by 40%, uh, in some countries. That's an annualised number, but it's a quarterly change in GDP. So it's sort of 10% uh, over the year. The numbers are so different to what we usually see that they're quite difficult to interpret. I think what it's fair to say is that in most economies, uh, I don't know of any that haven't fallen at all, but uh, in, in pretty much every economy, we've seen very significant falls in GDP starting at the end of the first quarter, of this year and then a very significant fall in the second quarter. Normally with recessions, um, what we see is that uh, the bounce back from recession is quite uh, significant. So we, what, we, what we worry about as economists is do we see a bounce back to the trend line that we were on prior to the recession or do we see a recovery but no uh, reversion to the previous trend line? Most recessions, until some of the very recent uh, recessions, the global financial crisis being one, uh, were ones where the reversion was uh, quick enough and significant enough that we saw a reversion back to trend. Um, so in the 1980 and 1990 recession in Australia, after that recession, GDP growth was actually quite rapid. Whether we hit trend or were close to it or not, who knows, but we got pretty close to back to what you could consider to be a trend after those most recent recessions in Australia. You can see here that the OECD is forecasting that we, that won't be the case. Even in their upside scenario here, we're three or 4% uh, in terms of global GDP uh, below what the trend line would have been uh, at the end of next year. Uh, and that has significant implications for employment uh, and, and other economic outcomes as well. Um, so that's a very severe fall in global GDP. That's their upside scenario. And the problem, of course, is the, the mid-case scenario is, is worse than that. And the downside scenario sees global GDP about uh, 8 to 10% below where it would have been in the absence of the uh, coronavirus. Um, and Australia is pretty much tracking along those kinds of lines. Um, and in fact, uh, interestingly, in Australia, about the only sort of thing that's a little bit different to what we see in other countries is we've seen a more marked uh, fall in private consumption in Australia. So this graph just shows the uh, country outcomes as well as private consumption uh, changes over the past um, six months. And you can see there for Australia, 
um, consumption's fallen by 13 or 14% in the first half of this year, while GDP's only fallen by 6 or 7%. Um, so I guess uh, what, what that says is that this is a very significant economic dislocation. I don't think any of us uh, would, would uh, doubt that. Um, for 2021, in terms of the, the mid-case forecasts for, for a whole range of countries here, for, again, from the OECD, the interesting thing here is if you accumulate these percentage changes, um, what you get is that pretty much every country goes backward from the end of 2019 to the end of 2021. Um, Australia goes backwards just a little bit with those growth rates. The US goes backwards just a little bit. Uh, and about the only country that's predicted to grow at all is China, which uh, I, I would actually say that forecast for 2021 there is overly optimistic. That's uh, a very, very rapid growth rate in, in the world that we're, um, we're in. And, and also with China's demographics and other issues, I guess if I had to forecast China, I'd be thinking more like um, five to 6% GDP growth next year, um, rather than that 8%. But either way, there's still a growing economy through these two years, which is interesting and exceptional relative to other countries. India also has very rapid growth next year. I actually think that's more possible in India, but um, we will see obviously they're very dramatically affected by coronavirus as we speak. So that also might be a little bit uh, optimistic in the case of India. Um, as I mentioned, obviously the other impacts on the economy are very significant. And as an economist, I think we focus a lot on GDP, but we probably want to focus more on, on employment outcomes. And, and of course, we do focus on those as well. Um, in the US, the, the headlines have been very um, severe in the sense that uh, unemployment peaked at about 16% uh, earlier this year and was forecast to go much higher than that. It's actually declined quite significantly uh, since that time. And in Australia, we've seen the same thing. We've seen declines in unemployment uh, over the past couple of months, which has been interesting and a bit surprising to economists. However, um, of course, what we've also seen is that uh, there's, there's a really unusual labour market out there. And um, the 6.8% the unemployment rate that we currently have in Australia um, comprises a lot of people who aren't working. So if you're working zero hours on JobKeeper, you're still defined as working. Um, and, and many of you will know from my classes that if you're working one hour, uh, uh, then you're defined as being in the labour market and working as well. So one of the features of the labour market that is, is very clear is that um, people are not working as much as they would like or as many hours as they were a year ago. So in the case of Australia, um, if you added in people working zero hours and also those who drop out of the labour market, the unemployment rate would be back up above 10% um, as we speak. And that would be true of uh, the United States as well. So in Australia, this is the first time we've had this sort of unemployment experience um, since uh, the early 1990s. And uh, I know that we've got a, a number of the uh, full-time class from this year in the audience. And I know that this is most challenging for people who are entering the job market. I've got two children who, unfortunately for them, are, are finishing university this year and looking for work. And it's an incredibly difficult environment uh, to be entering the labour market. So I just wanted to call that out for the, for the full-time class who are all looking for, for work as we speak and uh, wish you all the best of luck because this is an incredibly difficult um, environment. I have to say, I, uh, as Ian said there, he dated us, dated us both because uh, my wife actually worked for Ian very early on in her career. Um, so um, uh, 1993 was when I graduated at the end of the last recession and I certainly know how difficult that is to be looking for work uh, in that sort of period. Um, so that's going to be one of the outcomes here. Is what, one of the things we know is that um, people who are in this situation of, of graduating um, in a time where we're in recession can be kind of left behind in some sense in terms of lifetime earnings uh, and employment outcomes. So it's going to be a much harder job for, for people who are graduating now in terms of gaining employment and getting the outcomes that they really deserve. Um, I've got, uh, I pulled this um, picture off from, uh, from the Guardian and I, I sort of thought, well, maybe I should not include just men, but men are probably the easiest to interpret here. Um, and one of the things you can see very clearly here is this is the participation rate of men 
it's interesting, you can see it always dips down during recessions. Um, but uh, what we've seen recently is this, again, this dramatic dip, dipping down of the full-time uh, employment rate of working aged men. Um, uh, and that hasn't recovered even with the falls in um, the unemployment rate recently. So we've got a lot of uh, men and women who normally would be in the labour market who've left the labour market as we speak. Uh, and what I would say as well uh, from on the slide here is the, the monthly unemployment numbers in most countries are going to be very difficult to read because of how do you interpret people who are on JobKeeper. Uh, different countries have a lot of different schemes uh, to support workers and, and they make the uh, interpretation of the usual unemployment numbers very difficult. So I wouldn't read too much into the falls in unemployment that we're seeing in many countries as we speak. And particularly because it now looks likely in Europe, for example, that we're going to see a significant second wave leading to further lockdowns. And so those unemployment rates are going to bounce back up and, and bounce around again over the next few months. Um, so where are we going? Well, that's sort of where we are now, a little bit of where we're going over the next few months. I think with 2021, the obvious issue is the, uh, the course of the coronavirus, whether or not we have a vaccine or a treatment. Um, and so it's, it, again, 2021 is just a huge amount of uncertainty in terms of where we go. Um, so these are again, uh, some slightly differently presented projections from um, the OECD and again, a different range of countries. But the range of forecasts there for GDP on the right side of that panel there uh, is, is, is much, much wider than what you would normally see. And again, even in China, you see a range of forecasts from the OECD between five and 10%, for East Asia, between two and 7%, uh, and for India, between eight and 12%. And all of those differences will be driven by uh, coronavirus outcomes. Um, and again, very significant differences there for the United States as well. And I guess what I would say is that looks to be a pretty optimistic bounce in the upside scenario there for the United States. Um, so where are we going beyond 2021, I think is a more interesting question to me. As I say, 2021 is just very difficult to read. Um, so the question is, where does the economy go beyond 2021? got this in my conclusions, but many of you will have heard me present before, and you'll know that I'm normally pretty optimistic about Australia's economy, um, about Southeast Asian and regional economies, uh, and about China's economy. I have to say, I'm not, I'm quite worried. I don't, I don't think there's reasons for optimism uh, for where economies go over the next two to three years, over the period of 2022, 2023, and perhaps even beyond that. Um, so this is just a significant hit to economies, and it's been much more difficult to manage. When businesses go out of business, they don't come back quickly and therefore employment doesn't come back quickly uh, and the economy just uh, can slide along. So um, that's my, my great fear uh, for 2022 and 2023. Guy DeBell, the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia spoke yesterday, more or less saying the same kind of thing that they were concerned, again, reading between the lines as you have to do with the Reserve Bank, uh, they were concerned that uh, this will be a, a fairly long lasting uh, recession uh, in the sense of the employment hit and, and the hit to the rest of the economy. Uh, and I think that's right. I think this is not something we'll bounce back from in 2022, even if the coronavirus issues are fully resolved uh, through the course of 2021. There's a number of ways of looking at that. I guess, again, the simple way to look at it to my mind is just what is happening to businesses? Are they are they going out of business and not able to come back for some time? There's been some really interesting things happen here in Australia and in other countries in this regard. Um, what you're seeing in, in many countries is big falls in the amount of uh, insolvencies, in the amount of personal bankruptcies and so on. But that's because of changes in rules. It was announced today uh, in Australia that there'll be further changes um, to insolvency rules. Uh, essentially to allow companies to keep on trading and trying to get them to work through it. So one of the changes, which I think is sensible in the current environment, is that businesses are going to be able to uh, trade and manage their own way out of uh, norm normally what would be insolvency situations, rather than having a, a, an administrator come in and, and, and take over the company. Normally, I think most economists and uh, accountants and so on would say that's 
probably not the way it should happen. Um, it's, um, penal it's a penalty to uh, creditors. Uh, but I think in the current environment, that's a pretty sensible thing to do. And the hope is as the economy picks up, many of these businesses will be able to recover. But in Australia, for example, what we've seen is a 50% fall in insolvencies from this time last year. Um, so <laughs> even in normal times, many of the businesses that are trading would be, would be insolvent. Uh, but of course, with coronaviruses, coronavirus, you'd expect to see many more businesses uh, being insolvent. So we're storing up a lot of issues here and they'll come home to roost um, when uh, these companies are forced to become insolvent and uh, who knows when that will be. There's a lot of still very tricky issues here in terms of how to resolve issues around uh, creditors versus uh, rent and interest and other, basically how you resolve some of the creditor issues in, in the environment that we're in. Um, we've already seen in the US a number of prominent uh, bankruptcies. I've got some of the retail bankruptcies listed there at the bottom. Um, Roots, a Canadian company that uh, the Canadians here among us would be very familiar with. Uh, but um, some very big names there have, have gone bankrupt in the retail sector in the United States. These are sort of Main Street retailers. Um, and uh, Hertz is, I think, um, another company that's listed there uh, that's gone bankrupt. Some very big names. And it would be surprising if we didn't see some similar sorts of names start to pop up in Australia going forward. So that, to me, is the real issue. Um, what happens after that uh, in terms of recovery? How quickly are we able to create new businesses and create jobs? In terms of the policy responses that we've seen and can expect to see, um, you know, it's interesting. I think there's been some debate in Australia about the, the response from the government, um, but uh, I think it's been pretty good. Um, the, the, the response from the Treasury, they were criticised for getting their forecasts wrong. Um, but most countries have been having to operate um, very, very quickly in terms of the policy cycle. So normally, when I worked in the Treasury, you had a full year to work on the budget and, and you know, things changed pretty slowly in terms of our reading of the economy over the course of 12 months. But um, our, the Treasury Secretary in Australia, funnily enough, um, wrote a prominent paper on pandemics in 2006. Um, that was a piece of work that was uh, driven by the SARS epidemic and, and what the sort of worst case scenarios might, might be as a result of that. And it's interesting, he said recently that he's drawn on that work in a, a lot of the policy responses um, that have occurred in Australia, um, but it's been much more difficult than he anticipated. Um, the interesting thing is that um, the, the responses have been quite different in different countries. So I think in the UK, they have been paying people to stay at home, slightly different to Australia where they've been paying people to, uh, to sometimes stay at work in the office, but been supporting businesses whose revenues have fallen significantly. The nature of support, fiscal support in different countries has, uh, has varied significantly from country to country. But the point is, these are the uh, percentages of GDP in the graph here from different forms of support in different countries. And those are very, very significant fiscal injections into the economy. Interestingly, in Australia, it's about 11 or 12% of GDP, uh, according to the OECD there. But that's actually quite low relative to some other countries. Uh, Italy's had an extraordinary amount of support. And I guess my worry is that Italy's a country that probably can't afford that. And the interesting thing uh, out of all of that is that the IMF is expecting advanced economy uh, debt to GDP ratios, that's the gross debt to GDP ratios, to reach 132% of GDP by uh, the end of next year. In Australia, that's only um, 64%, uh, which for Australia is very high. Um, I look more at the net debt than the gross debt, but uh, even net debt in, in many countries is now well over 100% of GDP, which is going to be very difficult to manage going forward. And from this panel from the International Monetary Fund, what you see is once again that the size of the impact on debt and um, uh, deficits in, in the economy is, is far more significant than even uh, those that we saw during the global financial crisis. Um, and uh, the, the, I couldn't actually get the debt at the end of next year, although I can probably get it, you can kind of get it from here by, by adding the left hand map to the, to the right hand. Um, a table. 
Um, what I've got here is the um, increase in public debt in the, the histogram on the right, and just a map showing some countries that are already highly indebted uh, on the left. So many European countries are going to be in huge difficulty by the time we get to the end of next year in terms of public debt to GDP ratios. And uh, if you add um, the 30% uh, the increase in debt in the double hit scenario from, from COVID, which looks like it's gonna be the relevant one, uh, if you add that to Spain's uh, already 110%, I think it is, debt to GDP ratio, it goes to 140% by the end of next year. So I, those levels are ones that really concern economists um, there's a very well-known book by Carmen Reinhart and uh, Ken Rogoff arguing that once public debt gets above 90% of GDP, there's usually some form of crisis or monetization of that debt. I think the interesting question that I know a few of you raised, um, Adrian also raised this in his questions, was modern monetary theory, which is essentially um, monetizing debt. And um, it looks like we're going to have that experiment because there are plenty of countries that are in that sort of range of, of debt that's not really manageable in any other way. Um, in terms of, that's the fiscal response. In terms of the monetary response, um, Paul Keating has been very critical of the Reserve Bank in Australia uh, in the last day, uh, former Prime Minister. I don't think that's warranted, to be honest. I, I think the, the monetary response in most countries has again been very significant, working very quickly. Um, I would say the Reserve Bank in Australia has done a, a very good job. Um, he's, the the uh, former Prime Minister has argued that the, the Reserve Bank ought to be buying up government bonds and, um, and, and supporting the government in spending money. Well, I guess the point is the, the government has to be the ones who are spending the money and um, having the policies to do that. And they have to ask the Reserve Bank um, to buy their bonds which in the case of Australia uh, doesn't need to happen. There's plenty of demand for government bonds already in the market. Um, but what, what has happened, of course, is we've seen further reductions in interest rates. Most countries already had low interest rates, so they didn't have far to go. Um, and a number of countries are now in negative interest rate territory. I, I'm not sure that's a sensible place to go. I'm not sure that it really supports the economy. And it just really shows how sort of distorted the economy is if you, if you get into that situation. Uh, in Australia, I guess the uh, Reserve Bank has um, uh, intimated that it's likely they will cut rates further from 0.25%. But I think in the markets, they're, they're seeing that as a cut to 0.1% uh, cash rate in Australia, uh, but also operations to bring down the borrowing costs on, on three year and longer uh, loans, so basically acting on the yield curve. And um, again, I, I, my view on monetary policy is all of that is appropriate, um, but you can't expect too much from monetary policy. It's kind of like pushing on a string. Uh, it's been argued that the Reserve Bank should make more um, liquidity available, but if the banks aren't using that liquidity to lend, there's not a whole lot else that central banks can do. So I think it's unreasonable to expect um, central banks to be doing too much more, to be honest. I think you have to have other policies supporting the economy other than monetary policy, and the expectation is too great on the, on the central bank. The other issue is um, inflation over the next uh, two, to, two to three years or so, and you're just not going to see inflation in the next um, three or four years. The Fed has announced um, that they want to get inflation up above 2%, and they'll sort of act on that in a policy sense. Um, but uh, the top graph here from the Financial Times is a really interesting one. It's the 10-year uh, forward, uh, Treasury forward rate in the United States, and that's, that's declined very steadily. What that's suggesting is that the expectations of inflation in the United States in the next 10 to 20 years remain incredibly low in the order of, uh, you know, 1% to 2% or so, or less. So we're just not, in expectations, we're just not going to see any inflation. I think that's a strange expectation. I don't think it's going to be quite that long before we see any inflation, or in some sense, I hope not. Um, but um, I do think the next three to four years or so, when we're not going to see very much inflation, despite all of this monetary stimulus. That, of course, does have implications for equity markets and property markets and so on. Um, that leads into modern monetary theory, which is something that a few of you asked in your questions um, when you were registering. Um, 
And the, the modern monetary theory, there's a few different sort of versions of this kicking around. There's a very prominent economist, actually, Adrian, you could go and talk to him. He's at Newcastle University. Uh, Bill Mitchell, who taught me uh, in honours in Adelaide um, many years ago, uh, he's a very prominent proponent of modern, modern, modern monetary theory. Um, and the basic idea is that central banks are in this unique position where they can print money. And uh, so what they can do with that, that ability is print money, um, buy bonds from the government, the government can spend that money. But from the central bank's perspective, they don't have to worry too much about their balance sheet position. They can build up these, um, these uh, set government bonds and not really ever be expected to rep be repaid. Uh, and the old idea used to be that they would just burn those government bonds and, and uh, uh, write them off. Um, now, lots of governments have done this. Uh, many governments in South America have done this. Argentina has done this. Uh, Russia, Zimbabwe. Uh, and I guess the point is that if you take this to its limit, it's clearly problematic. Um, and I think that's the problem with modern monetary theory, that governments, if, if, if you told them they had this license, they will almost certainly abuse it. And that will lead to very high money growth and, and very high inflation. Having said that, I think there's probably a reasonable argument for doing this in a more limited sense. Um, so what we've seen in the US is uh, on the bottom slide there, the increase in the money supply is very significant, again, relative to sort of recent history. Um, and uh, if some of that was converted uh, into this sort of um, uh, bond finance government spending where the central bank is doing the financing. I don't think that would be hugely problematic. But if central banks were, start to, were going to start to write off 20 or 50 or 60 or 70 percent of Italy's uh, debt, I think that's likely to create some problems. Uh, in fact, the European Central Bank have said that they're not going to be able to do that. In short, I'd be suspicious of the free lunch that um, modern monetary theory seems to imply. And in some sense, where someone tells you there's an easy way for an economy to generate growth and it doesn't really rely on hard work and um, human capital and NAUS, then I think you should be suspicious. And in some sense, modern monetary theory is the idea that there's a very simple way to generate GDP growth and employment outcomes. And I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. So that's my, my short response to mon modern monetary theory. But as I said, I think we're going to see some kind of experiments in this regard in the sense that we are going to see some um, monetary financing or some, um, um, some, some debt financing of um, uh, government expenditure uh, by central banks. Um, in Australia, I thought I'd just briefly talk about Australia and where I see the recovery here. Um, so the good thing about Australia is we have plenty of fiscal ammunition over the next um, two to three years. Um, to support the economy. So there's no, reason, there's no reason why the government can't continue to do what it's been doing through the course of 2021 and even 2022. The whole idea of the government getting back into the black, uh, and, and that would be the case for some South, uh, Southeast Asian countries as well. That, that's not really very sensible. We, we need to really support the economy over the next um, uh, two or three years. There's been a lot of debate in Australia about more fiscal policy, about Paul Keating's argument about monetary policy being more aggressive. To my mind, once again, the issue is how do we support an economy that really looks the way we want it to look? And that's a more innovative economy. In the case of Australia, we do need to pivot away from mining, away from a reliance on China. And, and that's the sort of thing that um, uh, it's going to require quite a different pivot for the Australian economy. We got out of the global financial crisis because of China's demand for mineral resources. I don't think we can rely on that in 2022 and 2023. Um, the, the chart on the left there just shows measure, a measure, there's a few of these around, of how innovative and how um, uh, productive an economy is. And it's interesting there that some of the most innovative economies in terms of innovative innovations um, uh, support to the economy are not large countries, not large economies. And so there's no reason why Australia couldn't be in that list of countries that is more innovative and relies more on, on high tech, high innovation parts of the economy to support the economy. And that's the supply side uh, focus that I think has been a bit missing in some of the debate about policy responses in Australia. And, and this is true for other economies as well. 
there has to be a supply side response in terms of supporting firms, um, supporting human capital development and so on going forward. So I've got a, just a few more minutes, uh, I think, for the presentation. So let me uh, keep on moving and, and move along to geopolitics, which is, again, related in the current environment to uh, the economic outcomes because of the difficulty, I think, we're having in a lot of countries with negotiating and dealing with China uh, in the current world. So big question, I think, that arises with coronavirus, but it's really been in the, in the picture since um, the global financial crisis has been whether globalisation is, is kind of finished or not. Um, and I think the short answer is that it, it's going to be a very different type of globalisation going forward and it's not as open as what we saw up until 2008. Um, and there's a couple of drivers of that. One is increasing inequality that's led to the backlash against globalisation in many countries, particularly the US. Um, but also, of course, the, the US-China disputes um, and uh, that's really raised the heat globally. China also, I've got a, a slide on, on trying to understand China. I think, I'm not sure any of us understand um, Trump and what he's doing, but um, we, kind of, we kind of do understand it. Whereas with China, I think it's really important to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and China's policies under Xi Jinping have been very uh, mercantilist, very nationalist, but they have been a follow on from uh, earlier policies, he's, he's a bit more aggressive than previous leaders, uh, but it, it isn't really a significant change in stance. Uh, it's just been more open in the last two years in terms of what's going on there. Uh, and, and Australia definitely is not the only country that's having issues with China. Of course, we know the US, but the, the EU, Japan, um, and other countries. Um, interestingly, uh, China's just put tariffs on German pork um, and that was in retaliation for some of the German statements, um, I forget even what they were, but um, many countries are having difficulty with, um, with China. In terms of what's going on in China, um, it's interesting to me, as many of you know, and so many of you have been to China with me on, on some of the study programs that MBS has run. Um, the, the, the thing I used to always say was that in, in terms of information control, for example, China was taking two steps forward and then one step back. Um, we're loosening controls and then tightening a little bit, but in general, moving to less information control, for example. This has changed since 2012 and particularly since 2018. Um, you used to very rarely see a blanked out TV screen in China. Now you see them a lot. Um, and that's been part of a deliberate part of the strategy of, of Xi Jinping. The interesting thing that probably most people don't know about is that the policies have been very values driven. Um, so the picture on the left is a, a one that's um, censored by the Chinese censored. Uh, the, the lady on the right hand side has pink hair. So she's been given a, a little watermelon cap there, one like our daughter used to have, um, because her pink hair was seen to be inconsistent with Chinese values. Uh, and they've been um, blanking, pixelating earrings on men, tattoos, and so on on TV channels. There's very much a, a movement by the Communist Party towards more sort of Chinese values and more sort of traditional type values, which is interesting. And of course, not all Chinese agree with that, but um, um, they're sort of having to live with that. China's clearly more nationalist and less shy about its ambition uh, in terms of uh, expansion, um, South China Sea issues and so on. And the one sort of big tension is that um, China still argues, that the CCP still argues that it's a market-driven economy, but there's a lot more centralised control. And this is one that China is, um, I think, where there's a real tension. Um, there's been criticism of China's approach from a number of countries. And interestingly, there does seem to be a little bit of a back down in the last month in terms of this, what's been called the wolf warrior um, diplomacy. Um, so we'll see where that goes. I guess the important point here is don't expect China to change significantly. So we have to learn to live with China. And I guess I hope that um, we start to form alliances with countries. Uh, and, and I guess from a Chinese perspective, it's not clear whether they'd like Trump or Biden to win the US election. Biden will clearly um, follow the global norms more, build alliances, and that's probably more of a threat to the Communist Party 
than, uh, than what Trump would do, which is basically go it alone. Oops. Oops, I'm stuck on my slides, I apologise. Okay. Um, I think I've mentioned most of these points, but China, I think, is an interest, at an interesting juncture. It's got a lot of difficulties, very high debt levels. Um, you know, they've had problems militarily on their border with India. They've got potential inflation. Um, so it's not clear that, that China's more nationalist and in some sense more isolationist policies will be effective in getting them uh, to where they want to get to. So I think that's the interesting question about China. I'd have a lot more to say about China's innovation policies, the made in China uh, and the earlier innovation policies that they've had. Um, but uh, to be successful with their innovation agenda, it's not clear that turning away from the rest of the world is the right way to go. However, we will see China has been very successful in, in managing its economy over the last uh, two or three decades. So what does all of that mean for Australia? Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting that Japan, India, and Australia have, uh, are in the process of trying to flesh out the details around a uh, regional um, supply chain initiative. And that's really about relying less on China. Uh, the stated agenda is to diversify supply chains and so on, but reading behind the lines, it's clearly about um, countries supporting Southeast Asia, supporting uh, South Asia, uh, and for Japan, they want to move their uh, operations that they have in China out of China to other countries. So there'll be, I think, some interesting uh, goings on in that regard. And Australia really needs to be a part of those discussions in, in South and Southeast Asia. We are more heavily reliant on China in terms of trade than many other countries. Um, luckily for us, China needs our iron ore. Um, and there's no other cheap sources of iron ore. We're at the lower end of the cost curve iron ore in Australia, and that's really to our advantage. But um, for those who aren't trading minerals with China, just don't expect things to change in the next, certainly not in the next um, two to three years. Um, Xi Jinping is presumably going to hold power after 2022, when the normal two-term uh, limit it would have come into play. Um, so I, he's clearly not going to change his mind in terms of uh, how China progresses. And that's going to make trade with China just increasingly difficult. Uh, it will be interesting to see where that goes over the next uh, 12 months or so. The US election will definitely have implications in that regard. A couple of other issues that people have always interested in, I think. Um, one is uh, the local property market. And here, again, I'm, I, I think, uh, and, and this will be true of um, so places like Singapore as well. Um, where international demand is very significant in the property market. Construction in Australia is about um, 12 or 13% of employment and about 9% of GDP. So it's very significant. And the fall in property demand that we're likely to see is, um, is going to put a significant um, ch challenge to our economy. So in Australia, the economy has been driven by construction and by mining and the other sectors have sort of tagged along for the ride. So if, we've, if, we, uh, if we see demand from China slowing down and then we see construction having difficulties, we're going to have very diff a great deal of difficulty going forward. So the falls in immigration that we're of course seeing because of coronavirus are going to present significant challenges to us going forward in the property market. And also the equity market. Um, I, I, I can't understand equity markets. Um, they seem to be way too high in the sense that uh, we economists think about them, where we think about the discounted value of future earnings driving um, equity prices. Clearly, liquidity is the big driver of, of, um, of equity prices at the moment. And the interesting thing about the, the little graph on the left there at the top uh, is showing that every time there's a QE announcement in the US in an earlier episode, um, stock markets bounce or they, they bomb when there's an announcement that QE is going to end. So clearly the current QE in many countries is a big driver and liquidity more generally of equity markets. The fact that there's low returns elsewhere. But um, if you read The Economist magazine, you'll find plenty of arguments to make you question um, uh, the rise in equity markets. My sort of rule of thumb is if taxi drivers are telling you about equity markets, it's time to get out. 
At the moment, retail traders are very significant in equity markets, and that is a red flag. I, let, me, let me leave that one at that. Um, so I hope that's sort of given you a little bit of the flavour of where I see the global economy now and, and where it's going and the, and the geopolitics. As I mentioned, I'm usually an optimist with regard to Australia's economy and, and Southeast Asian economies. Um, always be ups and downs, but we have a fundamentally resilient economy, one that um, is, uh, has been blessed with having both sides of politics, having a strong reform agenda. Uh, in many parts of the world, you would not say that, but you would say that about Australia, you'd say that about many um, Southeast Asian economies as well. But um, countries that are too reliant on China are going to find things difficult going forward. In Australia, as I said, we have too much reliance on housing and we need to support the supply side, as I said earlier. So going forward, we have to, one of the things I would say uh, that we need more of in Australia is, is more entrepreneurship, more small business startups, see some different um, measures there. And I've got a couple of different ones there in the, uh, the one saying the startup culture here is strong one saying it's it's not so strong. Uh, but going forward, I think we're going to have to, in terms of policy, think about ways so we can support startups uh, and small businesses and not just think about uh, fiscal and monetary policy to support the economy. So that's uh, it. Ian, I'll uh, we'll, we'll hand back to the audience for some questions. Terrific, Mark. Thank you very much for those remarks. Mate, you have stimulated an enormous debate here within the audience and a whole lot of interesting questions. Um, folks, we're, we're right up against time. So what we're going to propose is this. Uh, next week, we'll be writing out to people anyway with a thank you for attending the lecture. And we're going to include in that a link. And with Mark's indulgence, uh, I'm going to suggest that he would actually uh, write brief answers to all of these questions which which have covered a whole lot of different aspects of the remarks that he's made and that those questions and the answers will be available through that link. Uh, but Mark, um, I can't let you go without at least answering the most uprated question which was asked by Jordan Green and it's a terrific question. One of the things we really can't allow to happen here is everybody runs away from globalization. I mean, that's a classic uh, immiserizing strategy if ever there was one. So how do we avoid that? You know, all globalization is bad. Let's retreat to some sort of autarkic set of circumstances. And, and where would the opportunities be for us in Australia if, you know, we assume that a lot of people actually do that, rush away from trade, and here we are sitting there. Have you got a quick answer to that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think everyone's going to rush away from trade. I just I think the nature of globalisation is going to be quite different. And that and the problem for every other country in the world is China and the US are just big. And they're, to some extent, um, driving a lot of the problems that we see. Clearly, Trump uh, is, a, is a big problem in terms of uh, his attitudes towards globalisation uh, and trade. And uh, if he loses the election, I think these, these issues will be made a lot easier. Um, but China is not making things easy either. They're deliberately um, using tactics that avoid scrutiny by the World Trade Organization, but their tactics on our barley uh, and on our wine and so on have been uh, not really, uh, ethical is the wrong word, but I, I think that's probably close enough. Um, and so how do we navigate between those two big monsters? The good thing for us is that all of Southeast Asia is facing the same issues. India is facing similar issues, although they're not as big a trading economy. So I, I think the interesting thing is with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there's a lot of, there's a strong agenda there for um, trade that doesn't rely on the US and China. They're sort of um, not uh, driving that agenda. So there are, I think there's enough common interest in our region, which is most important for Australia and um, Southeast Asia and so on, that I think we can still get things done. But I think we've got to be a bit careful about relying too much on China and the US. And even the WTO, where that fits in, I think will depend on the US election. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Look, just to break my own rule, because you bleed right into the second question, which is given everything you've just said, surely it's going to be much tougher for the Chinese. You know, there are two sides to this. If they cut everybody else out, that also hurts them. So, so how do you justify the strong prediction of a resurgence in growth in China against a background of China basically shutting the door on everybody. Yeah, I think that's right. However, I mean, 
a reading, there's a good article in the Financial Review by Andalini today um, about this strategy of attacking countries on particular goods. And it started with um, Norway giving the um, Nobel Prize to Leo Xiaobo, and uh, they, they banned uh, Norwegian salmon. Uh, and that tactic worked because eventually Norway backed down and they started to back um, uh, China in the UN and, and so on. But now so many countries have had those issues that I, I think there's a more of a push to, okay, let's push back against China when they do that because clearly they, we can't let them win all the time or we're just gonna be rolled over. Clearly the Australian government's, I think, got that right without being too openly aggressive. We just haven't rolled over to China, which I think is the right tactic. Um, and from a, from a Chinese perspective, I think you're right. I think there's a big risk to their growth, but we can't diversify in the next 12 months away from China. And, and so that's the issue. This supply chain initiative with India and Japan will take um, years, probably four or five years before we have significant diversification in terms of supply chains away from China. And in the meantime, their growth is still being very strongly supported by exports and by uh, links into the supply chain in the re supply chains in the region. Mm, yeah. sure. Mark, thank you very much indeed. As expected, such a big canvas, such a whole set of really important and interesting and timely issues. So on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you very much for the effort that you put into preparing those remarks and giving us the benefit of your experience. Uh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that'll bring us to a close, as I've indicated. Uh, we'll ask Mark to respond to all of the questions. I know it's frustrating when you ask questions and you don't get an answer. Uh, we won't leave you there. We'll ask Mark to give you brief written answers, and they'll go out with our thank you uh, note with a link that you can access from there. So thank you all once again, and warm thanks in particular to Adrian and to Christine. Uh, certainly thank you for joining us to acknowledge once again uh, the generosity of your, uh, of your late mother. Uh, in the gift so many years back now uh, in memory of your, of your late father. And thank you all very much also for joining us for this afternoon's uh, elect lecture. Before I go, uh, let me just, there'll be a slide up now. We do have a full and varied webinar program, uh, which I invite you to view on our website. But in particular, I want to draw your attention to the next public oration, which will take place on the 22nd of October, Thursday the 22nd. This will be the Charles Good Oration, uh, another wonderful occasion that the school celebrates every year, thanks to the generosity uh, of Mr. Good. And uh, this year, it'll be delivered by Martin Wolf, who many people in this audience would know. Martin Wolf, CBE, Chief Economics Commentator at the Financial Times. And Martin will join us from London to share a lecture entitled How to Save Democratic Capitalism, uh, after which I'll facilitate an audience discussion. To find more details on the school's website. And we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and very much hope that you can join us for that lecture as well. well once again, thank you very much to Mark Crosby, uh, our Hibbert lecturer, and thanks to everyone for attending. Good afternoon. <laughs>